Good morning, and welcome back. It seems like forever since we've had anybody in the sanctuary, and we are very excited as staff to have you back. Um, kind of feel like I'm at a uh, <coughs> church convention for bandits here, but... Uh, <laughs> And I'm really disappointed in the Lawrence family today because they were up for uh, recruiters of the month at least. They were the overachievers and then two thirds versus full. That just really so close. <laughs> they have uh, Caitlin's in town with uh, uh, Brady, a boyfriend, and they are not with us today. So that's why they're they're had a full, full view, but we think it may have been Ryan's haircut and his mask that was scaring people off. But uh, we are super excited to be together today, and uh, we are here to focus on the Lord, to have a great time in his presence. And uh, I just hope that uh, we can do that. If there's a glitch, we can see past it, and we can focus on the Lord and focus on the fact that we get to be together as a family this morning. Thank you for coming. And may it be a special time for us all. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's all stand. It says in Isaiah 44, verse 6, God says, I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no other God. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Father God, we just give you all praise and honor and glory right now. Worthy of praise. And Lord, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would just hover over this place this morning, God, as we raise our voice and lift our hands in worship and adoration to you, Lord. God, we just we just we desire you more than anything else right now. We ask you to be with us right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Baby 
things out with the sound over here, and I apologize. So it's a little loud. I apologize. I'm just kind of getting things worked out here this morning. So.
just tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know Oh, I won't be shaken I won't be shaken Cause my
series in 1 Corinthians, and I am thoroughly enjoying this in-depth study and the time that uh, I've been devoting to uh, this letter. And, I, you know, you're studying for years, and you think, wow, yeah, and then you just make this new study, and, and like, whoa, I am just blown away with what I've been learning and uh, growing, and I'm just excited to share it all with you. Uh, the only down part, of course, is that we're uh, not all together yet. People at home on Facebook and later on YouTube watching this. It's kind of interesting. It's not, you know, not exponential, but the YouTube channel has been growing. Uh, people in different parts of the world have been uh, subscribing to it. It's kind of interesting. And the comments that they leave. So those of you on Facebook and later on YouTube, we're glad you're with us. Um, and even though you may be watching as a family at home or you may be watching alone at home, uh, we just want you to know that together we are one in Christ and we're one in the Spirit. So we're glad that you're able to be with us as we share together. Chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians. And before we just dive right into the middle of this letter, this chapter, 
I want to read a passage of scripture that Paul also wrote a few years later. And he wrote it to the church at Colossae, uh, the Colossians letter. And what Paul says in these verses to the Colossians takes us into this, like this other dimension of life that we as Christians enjoy, but it's easily to miss. And it's how he, I want you to notice how he talks about how being in Christ, this new life, is reinterpreting this life that we are living out right now. That this is how we interpret our life. We interpret it in Christ. So this is Colossians chapter 3, verse 11. I'm just going to read it. It's from this, uh, the Kingdom New Testament that I've been using in this series. In the new life, in the new life, there is no difference between Greeks and Jews. In the new life, there's no distinction or difference of race. He says, in this new life, the new life, there's no difference between the circumcised and the uncircumcised. And the religious distinctions. There is no difference, he says, between barbarians and, and Scythians. And, and a barbarian was named that by the Roman world people because barbarians came down from the north and they spoke this language that they just couldn't understand. You know, and they called them bar, 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 bar. That's what it sounded like to them. So the word barbarian was born out of this confusion. Couldn't understand it. Barbaric language. Scythians were famous for just being really crude and rude people. And he just, Paul for some reason puts it in there and says, there's no difference between a, being a barbarian and, and being a Scythian. There's no difference, he says, between slaves and free. For our world, that would be rich and poor. Rich and poor, there's no difference. But, he ends it by saying, Christ is in all believers, and Christ is all that is important. Christ is in all believers, and Christ is the only thing that matters in this new life. So he's saying in this new life, this new dimension of life that you live, the only thing that really matters is Christ. You reinterpret everything today through him. So for Paul, he's saying there is no difference in race, ethnicity, culture, gender, or social status. And there's a part of your brain right now that's going, yes, there is. I see it all the time. I'm living in a world where there's all these differences. But you have to take into account what he actually says. And when he says that Christ is in all believers, that's when a little light begins to dawn. If you compare that passage in Colossians with the passage in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, Every one of you has been baptized into the Messiah, has put on the Messiah. You've clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek, race. There's no longer slave or free, rich or poor. There is no longer, there's no more, more male and female. You are all one in the Messiah Jesus. When you became a Christian, significant changes occurred. And things that once dominated your thinking and dominated your behaviors have been stripped of their power through Christ, his death and resurrection. And when you have been baptized into Jesus, you live this new reality. You are living in this new reality. And this new life that we have is a gift of grace. What it involves is simply out of our reach as human beings. This is a life that only God can give. So we have it by grace through faith. Now remember in this letter, and all of Paul's writings as far as that goes, how he will lay down a thought and
and then he'll begin to expand upon it. And he just kind of builds on different things. He can put another layer in there, add something to it, expand it more and more. And in chapter 1, verse 2, the very beginning of the letter, he starts off, you were called to be holy. You were called to be holy. Sounds good. And then he builds on and expands on what we talked about last week in chapter 6, verse 11. And he says, you were washed clean, pure. You were made holy. In Christ, you were made holy. You were called to be holy. And now you are holy. But you're also called to be holy. You see, over and over again, we just keep bumping into the same fundamental Christian truth. That we live between the now and the not yet. Now, in Christ, we are made holy, but we are also called to be holy. We're, we've got to work it out. Paul says in Philippians, work out your salvation. You're saved. Work it out with fear and trembling, awe and respect. This is where we live. And this in-between, between what we are and what we are becoming, this in-between space that we live this life on earth, this is a life of tension. This is a place of tension. We feel it all the time. So now we come to chapter 7. And in chapter 7, we come to all the questions that the Corinthian church wants to ask Paul, some of their issues and problems. Paul, at the time that he's writing this letter, is in the city of Ephesus in Turkey today. And some of Chloe's people have made the journey either by boat across the sea or over land, which is a long journey, to see him and to put these questions to him. Now, traveling from Greece all the way around to Turkey would be a long and expensive journey. So the church must really, really want Paul's input on these questions in a big way. And all of their questions seem to focus or center or coalesce around a single theme. This is all they're asking in chapter 7 and chapter 8 and chapter 9 and on. All they're asking is this one question. How does this new life in Christ work in real life? How do you really do it? How does it work and it sounds like, Paul, you're telling me this, but I'm living here. You know, I can, I can read, Paul, what you say in Galatians about the fruit of the Spirit, but when I look at how I measure up to love and joy and peace and patience and gentleness and kindness and all of that, self-control, I'm over here. And there's this tension between what you say, walking and living in the Spirit's life, and where I am. And if you say that there is no more male and female in Christ, how come we still feel all these desires and attractions? What do we do with our desires? And you can say that there's no more male and female, but there isn't a man or woman alive on earth who doesn't know the difference. And isn't going, yeah, God. Oh, sorry, that's a side note that probably should go down. I think they're asking simply, how does this new life in Christ work? How do you do it? Aren't we all asking the same question most of our days? How does it work? Now, here's what the Bible says. And here's where I feel that I am. And you can tell in this letter that they have the same kind of members in their church that we have in all of our churches, too, in, in the world. Because some of the members of this church are on the more, you know, liberal end of things. And they hear about the freedom in Christ that they have now in this new life. And they think, wow, the door's wide open. Anything goes. I'm going to go visit a prostitute. I want, you know, whatever I want to do. Thank you, God. That's a little bit on the liberal side. That's way over. But on the other end of the spectrum, on the other side, there are all these people who want everything spelled out in black and white. They want the rules.
people sit down so they know what they're supposed to do. Tell me and I'll do it. And they want to know what the rules are. And they want it in black and white because they can keep the door closed and keep the place clean and keep it neat and tidy after they get in. That's always the problem. What people say after they moved into the neighborhood, and they don't want other people in the neighborhood, but that's their neighborhood now. And you see, I think the majority of people live in between those two extremes. And we probably, on uh, certain things, drift one way, and then certain things we drift the other way, but most of us just live kind of in between. One of the things that I find so refreshing about God, at the same time so challenging, is how God always treats us as responsible people. That he refuses to live our lives for us. And that gets kind of scary sometimes. That he made us with this ability to respond, responsibility. And that is what makes love so wonderful. And it is the same time what makes life so difficult, tricky, and dangerous. Because you do have freedom. You can mess it up. You know, you don't really have any freedom unless you have the freedom to be wrong. If you didn't have the freedom to be wrong, you wouldn't really have freedom. And that's the way God made us. And I find when I read Paul that I find that same refreshing approach. Because when he writes, he's assuming that you and I, when we read it, are responsible beings. And I think you can see this in the way that he approaches their questions. The way that he addresses them. The way that he talks to them. Because he's giving them the truth. But he's giving them the truth in such a way that they have to think it through. They have to work it out. They have to figure it out for themselves. Only once in the chapter does he say, this is the Lord's command. Only once. But five times in the chapter, he says, now this is only my opinion. This is just me talking here, not the Lord. This is just, just what I think. See, he's not coming at them with a great big stick of Jesus' authority. And he's not criticizing the other teachers in the church who must be teaching and preaching certain things that the Corinthians are going, I'm not sure that's right. Let's ask Paul. You see, when he ends the chapter, the last sentence of the chapter, he says, and I think I have the Holy Spirit too. Why would he say that if there's not some teacher in the church saying, it is from the Holy Spirit that I'm saying this to you. And Paul's saying, well, I disagree with that. It's just my opinion. That's the wrong way to go. But I think I have the Holy Spirit too. And as apostle, I go, I'd agree with that. What is going on with this laid back food for thought? approach. Well, reading one of his letters is like listening to one half of a telephone conversation. It would sure help if you could hear the other half. You know, it would really help us a lot if we had stacked up over here all of their exact questions that they were putting to him. We got a pretty good idea from the chapter what they're asking, but we don't have the exact question. Maybe in in verse 2 of 7, we have one of them, a direct quote from somebody in the church, where somebody, and this is the one he starts with, someone is in the church is saying, or teaching one of the preachers, it's not good for a man to touch a woman. Boom. Um, black and white. Touch, in first century AD, was a euphemism for sleeping with. And sleeping with is a euphemism in the 21st century for having sex with someone. Can't anybody actually just say someplace, having sex? What do you got to come up with? Sleeping with, touch. You know, we don't talk about that. You guys are responsive in such a way that I'm not sure I'll have my job. <laughs> See, somebody in the church is saying, in this new life, if there's no male and female in Christ anymore, and then I think I know by the Spirit what we should do. We should never have sex again. 
and people are going to people are asking Paul, is that right? Is that how we should work it out? And others must be saying, if you go through the chapter, wait a minute, I'm not sure that's the right conclusion. And others must be saying, well, at least the unmarried and the widows who probably should never get married again and have sex anymore. Maybe they, they should just ignore the whole male-female thing. And when I think it is that category of married, I think he means his divorce. You know, people have been married before and have experienced all that stuff in life, but aren't now. And the widow, who used to know that stuff, and aren't now, and they're saying, then they shouldn't probably do that anymore. And then some of them are raising the question, well, does this new life thing means that if I am married, I should get divorced. Is that what I should do? Is that the direction I should go? And then some more say, well, what does it mean to us if we're married to an unbelieving spouse? I mean, if I'm married to an unbelieving spouse, is there any part of this new creation life that fits where I am? Or am I completely missing out on it altogether? Did I make a disastrous mistake? And those who have never been married, are they somehow now superior to everybody else because they are never been married? So if there's no male and female in Christ in the new life, wow, I'm on top of the world. And that would raise the question of then, finally, well, should engage people even follow through with their engagement should they get married? Now, I'm going to say something. And let's, let's just say this with bold letters. Everything else has been in just, you know, lowercase, regular stuff. This is bold. Your being a part of the new creation doesn't immediately remove you from being a part of the first creation. That's what we have to get our minds wrapped around. Your being a part of the new life in Christ, the new creation, doesn't immediately remove you from being a part of the first creation. Because in the first creation, everything was good. And male and female were created equally, and that God called it very good. The problem is that sin has entered into that first creation and distorted God's original creation, and what we experience today is tainted and twisted and distorted creation. But male and female in the first creation, created by God, very good. Sex was created by God, very good. Nations and races and their differences were appointed by God, all very good. But it has become distorted and twisted and disfigured by sin. So Paul begins this letter, chapter 1, verse 2. You are called to be holy. You're called to move from the distorted and the disfigured life into this pure life, this holy life. And holy in this chapter is in contrast to impure. It's in contrast to the polluted. You are called to a pure life, not a polluted life. You are called to a holy life. A, the, the word holy in English means healthy. In early English, they were spelled differently, but they had the same word. In other words, there are two different spellings for the same idea. One was H-O-L-Y, holy, sometimes with a W, holy. And the other way of spelling was H-E-A-L-T-H-Y, healthy, same word. Same idea. Holy means healthy. Holy is healthy over against unhealthy. It's pure over against impure. It's that, it's that, it's that clean over against polluted. So what does it mean to be holy in marriage? Well, Paul says, and I want you to notice how drastically different this is from what somebody else was teaching in the church. Listen again to what somebody was teaching in the church. It is good for a man not to touch or have sex with a woman. Good. He's, he's made a great good statement in church. Only problem is, it's distorted. It, 
puts the man first. It puts the man as superior over the woman. It's good for a man not to touch a woman. That's the way life works. In this chapter, Paul says something really revolutionary. Well, now he says, wait a minute. The woman's body belongs to the man. And the man's body belongs to the woman. So the woman has a right to sex just like the man has a right to sex. Revolutionary. We, we could read that and go, well, we got all kinds of understanding about that. When they read that first in, this, in the first century in their church for the first time, that just blew the lid off the church, I'm sure. What? He just said that a woman has rights in the marriage. And that was unheard of. That was absolutely, unequivocally unheard of. And that's what holy looks like in a marriage. Holy in a marriage looks with this mutuality, not any dominance. The man does not dominate the woman. The man does not lord it over the woman. That's out in Christianity. But in the distorted and pure world, the man has authority over the woman, and the woman serves the man. Now I'm going to do a little side note. And my side note, I just, I'll just say it like, you know, like, oh, this is only my opinion. But this is why I absolutely hate the F word. I hate it, despise it, because it refers to a man's conquest and domination over a woman. And that is unholy, impure, and distorted, disfigured creation of God. And even if people use it in some light, well, I just mean old balderdash when I say it. I don't care. It has its origin in a dominating, disfiguring way. That's an awful word. Is my opinion. For what it's worth, side note, nobody slips in my jaw. In verses 6 and 7, Paul says, life would be easier if you're all single like me. But not everybody can be single. A few verses later, he says, it's better to marry than to smolder with desire, because if you smolder with desire, you might light the fire outside of the fireplace and you get burned. Get my drift. Side note number two or three, if I can't keep you track today. <laughs> we don't know Paul's situation. Wouldn't it be nice if we actually knew? It would have been almost impossible for somebody to rise through the ranks of the rabbis and Pharisees and get to the level of education and teaching and power and authority that Paul had. I mean, he got letters from the Sanhedrin, that's the top level, to go and arrest Christians and put them in jail. He was the, he was the, you know, the point of the iceberg. He was the bow of the ship of all that stuff. One guy, how do you reach that pinnacle of power in that society without being married? Unheard of. So, after the Damascus Road and three years in, in uh, Saudi Arabia, in the desert, does he come back home and say, honey, I'm a Christian. And she is an Orthodox Jew from the right wing, right wing. And her family and her say, no way. Done. Divorce. Or was he always single and he just happened to rise to that level? Was he with him? You know, did he lose a wife for him? He never says. Nothing in history says anything about it. But he just says, I'm single now. I travel around all my mission work. I'm not encumbered in any way by, by all those other responsibilities. Wish you could be like me, but that's not the way the world works. He gets it. So in verses 10 and 11, he says to the married, don't think that being a part of the new creation means that you should get a divorce. No, it doesn't mean that. But he's clear about the command. This is the only place he says a command. Marriage is a part of the good creation and as long as you are here in the world, you should honor it. Now, 
to the divorce, I would say, side note number four, maybe, if you got divorced and marriage died, that doesn't mean you're not still part of the new creation. I can't find any place in the Bible where it says, you know, getting a divorce means the unforgivable sin. I'm standing here with a testimony for that. Now let's look at verses 12 through 16. I want to read these. 12 through 16. He says, to everyone else I have this to say, this is just me, not the Lord. If a Christian has an unbelieving wife and she is happy to live with him, he shouldn't divorce her. If a woman has an unbelieving husband and is happy to live with her, she shouldn't divorce him. You see, the unbelieving husband, you see, is made holy by his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy by her husband. Otherwise, your children would be impure, whereas, in fact, they are holy. I think that's the right translation, impure. But if the unbelieving partner wants to separate, let them separate. A brother or sister is not bound in a case like that. God has called you in peace. Very important verse. If you're a wife, how do you know whether or not you will save your husband? If you're a husband, how do you know whether or not you will save your wife? Again, contrast between holy and impure. It is the same in the marriage as what the children produce in such a marriage. The contrast with those children is between holy and impure. All Paul is saying is, your marriage under God is a whole marriage. It's not some kind of a half marriage. And the children, therefore, are not impure. But he says, God has called you to peace. You shouldn't be upset by your situation. And again, don't jump out of this creation into the new creation. That's not the way it works. You bring the new creation into this situation. Now, I want you to look at some of the troubling, uh, difficult verses. Page, uh, page, sorry. Verse 17. This is the overriding rule or principle. Everyone should conduct their lives as the Lord appointed as God has called them. This is what I lay down in all the church. This isn't just Corinth. This is everywhere. Verse 20. Everyone should stay within the calling they had when they were called. 23 and 24. You were bought at a high price. Don't become slaves of human beings. Don't let anything dominate you. So brothers and sisters, let each person remain before God, or it's, the, it's a preposition that means beside, parallel with God, in the state in which they were called. His concern in these verses is how easy it is for us to be dominated by something else. And that's not Christian. That's not from God. We can be easily dominated by the social pressures. Well, that's just the way society is going. And those things can dominate us. We can be easily dominated by our own guilt feelings. I mean, how many times do you struggle with, I did it again? We can be easily dominated by other people's opinions, what they think about us. We can easily be dominated by even our status in society. Well, I wish I had what they have. Or I feel so glad I don't have to go that way in my life. We can be easily dominated by pride. We can easily be dominated by needs. And he says, don't become slaves of human beings. And then he says, even if you are a slave, bring the new creation into your situation and see, reinterpret your servitude as service of Christ, you are serving Christ. And in Christ, you are free. Nobody can take that truth. Nobody can take that spirit. Nobody can take that love. Nobody can take that forgiveness from you. God's solution to the inequality of gender and the inequality of race and the inequality between rich and poor is so vastly different 
than the world's solution. And in fact, how many thousands of years has the world been looking for a solution for all this inequality and never has come up with anything? And as a Christian, we are supposed to see God's solution in Christ. We're supposed to work it out in the church, take it through, put it into practice, figure it out, so that the world will know that the solution is a matter of grace. It's a matter of faith. How will they know if we don't live it out? How will they know? In every one of the situations mentioned in the chapter, Paul is simply saying the same thing. Bring part of the new creation into this present situation. And being a part of the new creation doesn't mean that you should abandon your place in the present situation of creation. Look at verse 20 again. Remain in the calling you had when you were called. Why? Doesn't that create a little question mark above your head? Remain in the calling in which you were called. What? I mean, at first glance, when you really read that verse, you say, what do you mean? Paul is using the word calling in two different ways in the same sentence. One we know from chapter 1, verse 2. You were called to be holy. So God is saying, I want you to be holy. That's a call. That's the call upon your life. Bring that holiness of God into all these different relationships. But the other way he's using the word calling is your situation or vocation. A vocation is simply the Latin word for call, calling, vocal, or vocation. Not your job. Your vocation is why God put you here on earth. It's your whole situation, whatever it is, rich or poor, Greek or Jew, barbarian or Scythian, where, wherever you live, male or female, that's your calling. That's your assignment place. And it means to bring this new creation into your situation, whether you're male or whether you're female, whether you're married or unmarried, whether you're divorced, whether you're single, whether you're engaged, bring this new creation into this relationship now because that's the way that you move through the world. And that's the way the world will know that there is indeed a final solution. You can't separate your situation or your vocation from your calling to be holy. That's why he puts them together in the same verse. You are indeed a sermon in shoes. And your call to be holy in your situation is your personal assignment to do that. Now verses 25 to 31. Paul says in 25, Now, when it comes to unmarried people, I have no command from the Lord. But I give my opinion as, thanks to the Lord's mercy, a trustworthy person. This then is what I think is for the best. Just at the moment, we are in the middle of a very difficult time. Does that resonate with you today? And it's best for people to remain as they are. Are you bound to a wife? Don't try to dissolve the marriage. Have you had your marriage dissolved? Don't look for another wife. But if you do marry, you're not sinning. And if an unmarried woman marries, she is not sinning. But people who go that way will have trouble at the human level. And I would prefer to spare you of that. This is what I mean, my brothers and sisters. The present situation won't last long. For the moment, let those who have wives live as though they weren't married. Those who weep as though they were not weeping. Those who celebrate as though they were not celebrating. Those who buy as though they had no possessions. Those who use the world as though they were not making use of it. The pattern of this world, you see, is passing away. Now here's what's going on. In AD 51, the time he was writing this letter, the Roman Empire, that stretches from England, all the way to North Africa, all the way up against Iraq and Iran, which is Persia today. All of that from Spain, all of that empire. The entire Roman Empire suffered a tremendous famine. Now, a 
famine for us is like, well, there's just no food. Yes, you go to the supermarket and there's just very little food to buy and the rich seem to be able to find it someplace and the poor go in hunger. But it really means a, a terrible economic depression. Because it, like the agricultural society, everything gets wiped out. And you see, the Roman Empire was built on the foundation of providing through its military might a safe place of law and order. And the famine brought disruption in the streets, fear of robbery and thievery. And the Roman Empire promised to always have wheat from out in the empire to come and feed everybody. They would find it, and they couldn't find it. And they couldn't provide what they promised. And it shook people's confidence in the very foundation of their life. Everything they knew as a way of life was being shaken all based on the Roman Empire's promises. I think we can understand Paul a bit more after a few months of living in a pandemic. And we realize how fragile the world is. How governments and medicine and science don't have all the answers. And how fires and big storms and earthquakes can just upset everything. And Paul is saying, this is a momentary thing for you in Corinth. And his advice is basically, don't make any big changes or ch change anything in your life at this difficult time. This is not the time to go out and make a big change. He reminds them in verse 29 that it won't last forever. And then he uses that phrase over and over again. Live as though, live as though, live as though. The Bible has, when Jesus talks about this, the Old Testament prophets talk about it, when Paul talks about the second coming of Christ, when they talk about this, you know, we're living in the last days. We've been there since Jesus' resurrection in the last days. This is the last period of history. There's not another one coming. It's only Jesus coming back. But when they talk about that, they're always mixed together. It's kind of like because they have the eternal perspective to it, they always mix together the immediate and the big picture at the same time in the same sentences. And so you kind of go, whoa, 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 wait. Are you talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70? Or are you talking about the destruction, you know, of everything at the end of the world? And I think the answer would be, yes. <laughs> they, just, they just merge. And so when you read something like this, you're doing the same thing. You're trying to figure out, he's talking about something that's a momentary difficulty, but he's using these huge perspectives to do it. As though, as though, as though. And maybe this present difficulty is a way for us to realize that yes, this world is limited and this world is passing away and we have to hold everything that we have loosely. If we try to save our life, we'll lose it, right? So if we're trying to preserve something in this world, Jesus is saying, let it go. But it's our natural tendency to hang on to what we have. And in this pandemic time, we've had to put off doing things that we enjoy doing. And maybe some things we have lost, maybe forever. Maybe we'll never do them again. But our present distress and frustration and fears force us to apply what Jesus teaches. We have to learn what it means. Life does not consist in the abundance of our possessions, and life does not consist in the abundance of our activities. To live as though whatever you have, you could easily lose. Live as though that whatever you are in isn't the end of everything. That whatever you're doing isn't the do-all of everything in your life. Live as though this new life is bigger and better than what is passing away. That's not easy. I wouldn't stand up for a minute and say, that's easy to do. It's not. Because people in our society and in our church maybe are worried about losing a job, maybe losing their, their small business, maybe their retirement savings, their house. Maybe your ability to travel in the future. Maybe your health. And we don't know when it's going to get better. 
live as though. In verse 32, he says, I want you to be free from worries. I want you to be free from worries. Verse 35, he says, I'm not placing restrictions on you. Wow. I'm not placing restrictions on you. My aim is that nothing will get in your way of appropriate behavior, purity, and steady devotion to the Lord. Love. Holiness and love. He doesn't want us to be dominated by anything. He doesn't want us to be distracted by anything. I, and when I say it's not easy, it isn't, is it? You know, I go through this time in my life, and I think, you know, you get to be my age, how many summers have you got? And you just lose one. Now, I, I haven't even, you know, I went out painting once, and I went down to a place I really love, Sucker Creek, along the Oregon Idaho border. Drove down to Thursday night, I'm going to sleep in my Jeep, I've got it all set up, I'm going to paint. And I get up the next morning, I do this one painting, I love it, it's getting hot, you know, but I got my umbrella over me, no shade, you know, and I paint away. I go to another place I picked out, you know, and I, and I, I was up for the crack of dawn, you mentioned it. You don't sleep a long time, what a deep. And I went to the second place, and I'm starting to paint, and I'm feeling, ugh, I get sick. Not the virus, I got a virus. You know. And I drive all the way home, five and a half hours, bleh, you know, just, that's it, done. Bummer, lost it. Then this last weekend, I thought, well, this just last Friday. I got up early Friday morning, I had my Jeep all packed, and I'm gonna sleep in the Jeep, and I'm gonna go painting up by Mount Hood. I'm gonna go where Dad used to take his fishing and hunting boat lane. And I'm gonna go to that road, I love the views of the mountain. I know exactly what I wanna paint. And I drive three hours, and I get to the, the Forest Service Road, and there's a truck there, and it says, Road Closed, Forest Park. Every part that I wanted to go, can I go there? Can I go there? Can I go around the other side? No, nope, that whole area is closed. I go, fine. I did not feel really good about that. But I didn't have an alternative. I drove around looking for something, couldn't find it, and came home. Now, that's just minute stuff. That's like, oh, I lost my postage stamp. I'm so bummed. That's not a big deal that I'm talking about. But what you start doing is taking these little things and you start adding them up and compiling them more and more. And so pretty soon you're feeling like, I've lost the whole summer. Maybe my health won't hold out. I want to go to the Canadian Rockies someday. Maybe the board will never be, you know, you just go, whoo, in your summer. I don't think it's easy. I don't think it's easy to say, I am not going to be dominated by all the stuff that's going on in the world. I am not going to be dominated by social pressures. I'm not going to allow anything to dominate me. I don't think that's easy. Back in chapter 6, we talked about last week in verse 12, he said, everything is lawful for me. That's pretty bold. Everything is open to me. Everything is lawful. But... What a great word in the English language, and any language. But not everything is helpful. Helpful means holy. Not everything is holy. And then he goes on and he says, everything is lawful for me, but I am, I am not going to allow anything to gain control over me. I am not going to allow anything in this world to master me. I don't know about you, but I get up in the morning and that's what I want. And I know that I crash, I burn, I'll fall down someplace. I won't hold on to it. Something will start dominating my thinking. And I've got to come back. I've got to come back. Everything is lawful. Everything is permissible. Everything is possible. But I'm not going to let anything dominate me. Maybe the most important application today is to do just one thing. One thing. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ and you believe that he is the unique Son of God, and if you have been baptized into Christ and put on Christ, then ask yourself a question. Am I allowing anything to dominate me right now? Am I allowing someone else, something else, some fear, some frustration, something that makes me angry, am I allowing it to dominate my life? Am I allowing some need that I have, some desire that I have to dominate me? 
Ask yourself, what worries you? And then ask yourself, how can I bring Christ into my vocation, my place in the world, my assignment? How do I bring this new life into this place? And I think the way to do it is to go to him and ask for help. And I want to close with a prayer right now. It's a very famous prayer, but I just want to work my way through it. St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, Lord, make me an instrument of my peace. But I just want to go through it line by line. And I'd like you to listen to it. And if you agree, just inside or out loud, just say amen to yourself and to God. I agree. I agree. I agree. If you do, if it resonates with you. So let me pray as we go along. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there was hatred, let me be the one who sows love. Where somebody is hurt, let me be the one to offer pardon. Where there is doubt, let me come with faith. Where there is despair, let me be the one who offers hope. Where there is darkness, let me shine like a light. Where there is sadness, let me offer joy. Oh Lord, grant that I might not so much seek to be consoled as to be the one who consoled. Let me be the one not to be understood, but to understand. Not to be loved, but to love. For it is in the giving that we receive, it is in the pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in the dying that we are born to eternal life. At this time, uh, will you repeat with me our affirmation of faith? I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and my personal Lord and Savior. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to come back into your house and worship. We thank you for the music, the sermon, but especially this table, Lord, that we're going to come around and commune together. Thank you for this opportunity, the ability to worship you here um, and partake in this communion together. In your name, amen. On that night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and broke it and gave thanks and said, Take eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and he blessed it and said, This is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sin. So good to be able to come together and share the Lord's Supper. So miss that so much. It's so incredible. Thank you for coming today. Let's stand and be dismissed in prayer. Father, all these people in this room are greatly loved by you and very special to you. I pray for each one of them, Father, that your Holy Spirit may fill them. Fill them with your word. Show us all how we can bring this new life into our vocation, where we are. May you watch over us, Father. May you bless them, keep them safe, keep them from harm, keep them healthy. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Unless.